Our speaker today is Kina Cassard. She runs a 10-week women's therapy group for pelvic pain and sexuality concerns. My practice and approach in general is, is a very mind-body connection and um, hopefully you'll see that brought in um, through the presentation and I highly encourage it. It's, it's very important to get connected because a lot of women who work through these issues tend to have a disconnect from their mind and body and so we want to get them realigned. Um, if you have questions, uh, like you know, brief questions or just clarifications, I'm happy to answer as we go along. But if they're a little bit more in depth, um, let's hold those till the end, just to make sure that we have time. There is a lot of information. So the goal that I'm hoping you're going to be able to walk away from with this is being able to identify what some of the causes are, some of the, the typical causes of um, pelvic pain, as well as with anorgasmia. Um, being able to provide a, an overview of how you might be able to assess these issues um, while you're seeing clients, whether individually or as, as a couple, and then also some treatment techniques or ideas, some places to get you started and get the ball rolling. So what we're talking about is three different, um, three different diagnoses. However, there are a lot of other diagnoses that might also fall into the, these categories relating to female pain and anorgasmia. So vaginismus is the involuntary um, contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. So the pelvic floor muscles, they're a hammock-like structure that are in men and women that go from the pelvic bone back to the um, tailbone. And so they hold up our organs and if you can think about if you are um, using the restroom, and if you stop the flow in midway, that's when you're contraction, contracting your um, PC muscles. So that's a really great way to, to help clients get a sense of what that feels like. So a lot of times women are, real, like I said, really disconnected from their body, that they don't even have an awareness of their pelvic muscles. So even just simply starting to create that awareness can help them in the process of overcoming these challenges. This isn't necessarily a sexual issue. Um, vaginismus can happen to women who haven't had any sex. It can happen to all different types of women as well, different orientations, um, because it, they can experience pain or contraction with gynecological exams, tampon insertion, um, the, the use of sex toys, as well as with, um, with partners. Dyspronia, however, is the definition of it is pain during intercourse or penetration. Um, I like to think of that as sort of a general um, way of viewing it. And then anorgasmia is the lack of orgasm or the inability to orgasm. Let's see if I've got this. Okay. So to start, we're going to um, try to tackle this complex idea of what causes these issues. Um, there are pros and cons to identifying the cause or the etiology of sexual pain, of vaginismus, of um, and orgasmia, the pros would be it would be helpful to sort of help guide treatment. But then you also might be spending a lot of time trying to pinpoint the cause and because it can be a really complex issue, it might be a lot of time and energy spent on trying to figure out what was wrong rather than helping the client move forward. So, and this will be a case-by-case -case situation and, and something that you'll have to take into cl clinical consideration about what's the most helpful for the client. Um, the overlapping causes is what can be a big challenge um, because there could be something that creates the anorgasmia that also creates the dyspareunia um, and, and vice versa. So it, it kind of is a slippery um, thing to tackle in your clinical practice, but it might be something that, again, might be helpful for you. Um, when I said that it's complex, it's mainly a lot of issues come from the cultural societal beliefs about women and their bodies and messages that these women have received early on in their childhood and then also as they've grown up. So um, being able to explore those issues, and we'll get to that a little bit later, um, but those often have a lot of impact on women in regards to these, um, to these concerns. Another problem about trying to figure out what the causes are is that um, predominantly the research and the literature and the information has been from a male-dominated perspective and um, has left out sort of the female perspective of it. So there isn't a lot of information. Luckily, there is now, it's coming, 
now there's more information coming out from a female perspective, which is really great. And I have some information for you at the end of places you might be able to look to find a more female um, perspective of that. Um, like I said, there's complex reasons, or there could be really simple reasons. Like, for instance, a woman just might need to hydrate a lot more. Um, and, and it could be as simple as that. Or it could be complex, like um, a very oppressive upbringing around sex or sexuality, in addition to chronic yeast infections, and then potentially a really difficult uh, surgery that occurred maybe through childbirth. Um, and so trying to figure out what all of those things could be might make it a really difficult um, process for you to figure out what the issue is. Uh, but it can, again, provide an idea of where to go. Uh, a few specifics at all uh, I think is really important to keep in mind is that vaginismus, again, is a result of a lot of tension in the muscles and, and potentially a, a lack of awareness in the muscles. And dyspareunia is more of a tissue problem. So it's a, it's a concern of the actual tissue that's typically on the opening of the, uh, the vaginal opening, whereas vaginismus is more is muscular. So if you can keep those in mind, that'll help guide what you what sort of treatment that you can do and as you work with medical professionals that will help you have a sense as well um, and then for anorgasmia unless there is some sort of medical condition it's typically a psychological cause um, or a psychological issue that needs to be addressed all right so i started the work as douglas said on female sexual pain and pelvic pain and then I found that through the anecdotes my clients were telling me, and also having them finally get to a place where they were able, able to have penetrative um, sex or any sort of penetration <coughs> without pain, they were suddenly coming to me and saying, I can't orgasm. They didn't realize that that was sort of a trifecta diagnosis. Um, and so they often happen all together because a lot of the arousal and desire and comfort around sex has been a challenge and so they haven't been able to reach orgasm also because it's been painful. And so addressing all three of them and talking, looking at it from that trifecta diagnostic, diagnostic standpoint will be a really helpful way for you to start the treatment early on when you first start working with the client to help develop a sense of how you can address the anorgasmia in the beginning because they all seem to be very connected. Um, arousal and desire goes down with pain and discomfort around body image issues and um, sexuality has also gone down. So if you start to work on that in the beginning and start to work on enhancing that, you'll hopefully be able to address all of the issues a lot sooner. A lot of times too, um, these clients are given the incorrect diagnos diagnoses um, because doctors aren't as clear about it as we're coming to notice. And I've had a lot of clients who have been told by their gynecologists even maybe five of them have said, oh, you just need to relax more or you need to lubricate more. And they've been passed along from doctor to doctor saying the same thing. And um, finally, it's when they come to myself or to a gynecologist that knows a lot about these issues that they're told that they actually have a different sort of diagnosis. Um, so they've been given chronic yeast infection diagnoses. Um, there's a, a whole list that they come with the actually incorrect diagnose, um, diagnoses. And then sometimes you're only given one, like dyspronia, but you find out again, like there's the other two are involved, or dyspronia and vaginismus work um, typically hand in hand as well. And this is why I think it's a re really, really important to have a multidisciplinary approach when you are tackling these issues, um, because it will take a uh, medical doctor, a physical therapist, and the work that you will hopefully be doing um, with these women. And I'll get to that part a little bit later of how it's integrated. So um, from my own anecdotal experiences with clients as well as research has shown that the women who typically have these issues are um, the good girl or a type A. They are very structured, very organized. Um, again, this is a generalized statement, but this is what I've seen um, as the most common. Uh, these women have been straight A students or worked really hard in school, really like to do things right and go above and beyond. Um, they've also, like I said, liked control and structure. There's, um, and when you're looking at the clients that you have in your office, the list 
that's here is if you see them, if you start to notice it with clients, if they don't come to you presenting with mm -hmm. anorgasmia or dyspnea or vaginismus, then, um, and they're coming to you for other reasons, if you, if you see any of these, it might be a little flag to check into what they're, um, what they might be going on, what might be going on with them sexually. Um, so if they have a physical intimacy, if they're avoiding a physical intimacy, that means even like holding hands or cuddling or, t or just t any sort of touching with um, their partners, that might be a sign. A lot of women use pets, children, um, and work to kind of put that in between physical intimacy or relationship mm -hmm. concerns. And um, it's, it's a defense. It's, it helps support them and keep them safe. Um, but it will more than likely become a problem or an obstacle for them to get over. Uh, there's usually a difference in arousal and desire in partners, and then there's similar to the avoidance of the physical intimacy, not just sex, there's, there tends to be a, a, an avoidance of sexual intimacy. And then um, conflict in the relationship, and you'll also want to make sure that you do, in addition to um, any sort of medical conditions, medications that they're taking, um, substance use, exercise, those are all assessment um, points that we make sure to hit on when we first see a client. We also want to talk about sexuality and sex and how they're feeling about it. And um, that we sometimes forget to do that in a general assessment with a client who doesn't present with a sexual issue. But it's really important to make sure to get that sexual piece in as well. And then if a client comes to you with a sex, sex therapy issue, you'll want to know what all of these things are and how they're presenting in their life because it could be, like I said, something as simple as you need to hydrate more or you need to exercise and stretch your body more. Um, so there's a lot of pieces in our everyday life that come together to create certain issues and knowing about the full spectrum of what your client is going through will be really helpful. When doing a sexual assessment, this is a general, um, these are some general points that I think will be really helpful in helping you understand what sex has meant and what sexuality and their body has meant to the women that come to see you. Um, you'll want to know everything that, even negative things as well as positive things, especially first, any first time of masturbation, first time of a sexual experience, if there were any emotions around that, so if there was shame or guilt, um, and then of course the positive experiences and how those were different what made something positive and what made something feel negative to them. Um, you'll want to see the temperature and the attitude that women have around sex and sexuality as a child, a teenager, and an adult, and what might have changed for them, what they could, what they imagine might have been something that changed um, in their eyes from a child to a teen and a teen to an adult, and what sort of things influenced them. And then again, You'll see this point come up a lot throughout this because I think that the way that our society and culture views women and sexuality is going to play a really big part on what feels okay for women to be able to embody. And um, they, they have really profound impact, um, impact on, the, on these women in, in regards to how they're able to feel comfortable expressing themselves and their sexuality. Um, Identifying how they feel about their bodies, and especially around anatomy, odors, and fluids. A lot of women don't realize that, for instance, a, like the, the vaginal smell can be different from time to time depending on what point they're at with their cycle, for instance. And women aren't taught this necessarily, and so they feel really reserved, they feel really bad about this. But simply letting them know that it could change and that they might not like the smell, but it might be appealing to their partner, is an, might be enough information or, or permission given to, from you to them that could be really helpful and open up their, their ideas and their mind about what is okay. And getting them really comfortable with, with their body and their odors and fluids. Um, and even lack of fluids too. A lot of women get concerned that they don't have enough um, lubrication and that they feel abnormal for those reasons. Um, and so being able to talk about the differences with women about, about that. And then, like I said, talking about um, the positive experiences, because you really want, for the most part, I want to assume that mm -hmm. they have been given some negative views on sex and sexuality in their bodies, and so I want to be able to try to provide a positive space for talking about the good things, the things that they enjoy, and that will be really helpful down the line as you start to help them increase 
their idea of fantasy in, in order to increase their arousal and their desire. All right. Um, when it comes to sexual pain and vaginismus and orgasmia, you'll want to get a sense of the exact and specifics around this so that you know what you're sort of dealing with. Um, I'm going to take sort of a narrative postmodern approach to this and sort of externalize the pain or the sensation. And so imagine that this client is coming to you with an object and is saying, here's an object that you've never seen before. Like, help me make it awesome. And you'll want to know everything about that object through the client's eyes. So what does it look like? Uh, what color is it? How does, what's the temperature? You would want to know everything about this object if you've never seen it before and it's really important to this person. So asking them, what's the depth of the pain? Um, is, it on the, is it more on the opening? Is it deeper inside? Uh, does it feel like it's at the 12 o'clock position of the opening? So if you um, teach a client about if this is the vaginal opening, legs are up here straddled, um, and this is where the clitoris is, and this is where the anus is, you'll want to know, is that the 12 o'clock position or is that the 6 o'clock position? And, and help them guide that way so that you can have a sense of what it is. And, and then also, when you're talking with the medical professionals, you'll be able to have that lingo, because that's often how they talk as well. Um, they refer to um, the anatomy in that way. Um, and then you'll want to know the quality of the pain. Is it a sharp, searing knife? Or is it a deep, dull ache? Is it like cramps? Is it um, like a stick? And, and just kind of get their descriptions of it. It'll help you understand it better. And then um, the same thing with attempting to reach orgasm. Some women feel no increase in excitement or and they don't feel a plateau. If you're thinking about it in the, um, in the sexual response cycle, as Masters and Johnson <coughs> refer to it, Sometimes they don't even feel that increase. Sometimes they don't feel that plateau. And then, or sometimes they have it to the plateau, for instance, but they never reach orgasm or they never reach climax. And some women experience a deep burning sensation and so then they can't um, continue on with the orgasm because they're afraid that it, it's not right or they might feel like they have to pee. So any of these sorts of things are helpful for you to know so that you know how to move forward. And for each client, it'll be pretty different. Um, and then you'll want to, once you get a better sense of these two, you'll want to know what the feelings are around each part of it. What happens before you start to experience or attempt to experience an orgasm or what happens before the pain? What are your feelings around it? What are your thoughts around it? And we'll get into that a little bit more later about how to work that into the treatment that you do. And then if, if a client has a partner, I always try to get the partner in. Having their support and their knowledge and awareness of what they experience as well will be really helpful in the treatment. Mm -hmm. Most of these women have not felt supported whatsoever because their doctors, who are the relied professionals, don't have any sense of what this is, and so they sort of feel like they're um, floundering about in the ocean without a life preserve. Um, ha bringing the partner on as a social support and as their primary support in addition to the work that you're doing with them will be essential in helping them move through this. Plus, it'll bring the partner in on um, the experience of it, as especially if it's a male, and a ma I realize I'm making a generalization about this, but um, because men just don't have the vaginal anatomy, then they don't have a sense of what that pain sort of feels like. If the partner is a female, even though she has the same anatomy, she still might not quite get it. Um, trying to describe these sorts of pain, the sorts of these sorts of pain experiences, and um, to somebody who hasn't experienced it is really difficult to do. It's, it's sort of difficult to, to get a grasp on it. So bring the partner in if you can, mm. and you might even want to have uh -oh. you might even want to have a, f a bit of time with just the individual, and then bring the partner in. Um, but talk with the client about it, see what might feel best for them or for her. So we're, we're going to jump into treatment. This is good. Um, so before with pelvic pain issues, uh, the typical treatment was either sex therapists or medical professionals. There's been an integrated shift in the last 10 to 15 years and evidence has shown a multidisciplinary approach is actually the most beneficial for the client and most effective. 
Um, and so this includes physical therapy, a medical intervention, as well as psychological intervention. And then um, from the psychological intervention, I think psychiatry also is really helpful. And that's sort of my own experience. And I think that if there's a woman who's having um, any sort of pelvic pain or anorgasmia, if she has a difficult time tapping into her own resources as a result of mood disorders or something that can be um, supported through psychiatric referral or medications, that might be something that you'll want to bring in too, but keep in mind that, for instance, antidepressants can have, um, some antidepressants can have a negative effect on sex drive and libido and, and um, orgasm as well. So that way you're kind of uh, in connection with the doctors too in doing this multidisciplinary approach. Yeah. What do they do in physical therapy for uh, it? This is a really good question. Um, I think I'm actually going to address the oh, next you're one. Get there. Let's see. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for setting me up. That was awesome. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I'm glad. Um, and this was, I've had the, the uh, pleasure of meeting with Dina Goodman uh, and uh, Bonnie Cardenas. So Dina Goodman is a physical therapist on the west side. Bonnie is up in the valley. Their information is in the slides. I put their phone numbers on there. So um, please let them know if you have clients that you want to work with. Um, they're happy to do that. I have very lengthy conversations and actually ask them to sort of take me through what they do so that I can be able to share that with my clients. Um, so this can be, let's see if I have, oh I guess, did I not put their information on there? I'm sorry, I didn't put their information on there. Um, so it's Dina Goodman, you can Google her, um, and then Bonnie Cardenas, the last name is C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S. Can you spell that? C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S. She's in the valley. She's in the valley. Mm -hmm. And um, Dina's on the west side? Mm -hmm. Dana or Tina? Uh, Dina, D-E-E-N-A, -E -E two E's. Okay, so there's been um, support for physical therapy in regards to pelvic pain. Um, and what typically happens is the physical therapist will check out just the flexibility of the client, see if there's any places in particular that she holds tension. A lot of times that's in the hip flexors, in the legs, and in the back. Um, because these muscles, the PC muscles, sort of connect all of those. And simply doing hip stretches can help open up the muscles, relax the muscles, bring more oxygen flow in, and um, which will help with the vaginismus. Does the physical therapist do that, or they teach the client what to do? They'll teach the client. Um, they off. They also do that in the session. Um, Bonnie has a great, you know, Pilates, like how they have the. Um, I don't know what they're called. The former. former. Yes. Okay. Yes. Those things. So she'll have her do <coughs> certain exercises and stretches to loosen it up. And then what's really helpful to have a physical therapist on board with the work that you're doing is that she can actually do a vaginal exam and um, use her fingers to teach how to be able to do a proper Kegel. Um, as therapists, it's obviously something that we can't do. We can we can only do so much with words. So to be able to have somebody actually help the women feel what it feels like to um, clench at 100% and then at 50% and then release to zero, um, that helps the women get a lot more in touch with their body and have a lot more awareness. Yeah. It's sometimes the same treatment for um, uh, uh, urination, urinary incontinence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so you're aware, you, you know, it's and it's, you I bet, like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Was it with um, Cindy Graham? Yeah. Yeah, she's excellent too. That's another one um, for UCLA. Who? Cindy she Graham. Some machine. I forget what it was. Some machine. Oh, did yeah, she? She is R A H A M. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, she was very good. Yeah, she's fantastic. Her bedside manner. I mean, they all have really great bedside manner, but Cindy in particular is very, very warm. Um, and I bet from your experience that if somebody were to just tell you, "Oh, do this." Mm -hmm. versus show you, and so you it made a difference. It. Yeah. Have someone you can talk to and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And making sure too, like, am I doing this right? right? And they can say, give the feedback of, no, no, a little bit less or a little bit more, <coughs> or even just simply talking to you, I've noticed that your muscles have released. A lot of women have a difficult time 
going in and having this quite intimate experience with another person, t mm -hmm. typically a woman. Um, it's very like, um, sort of, it's clinical, but then it's also in a very personal area. And um, a lot of people don't really un have that understanding. And so being able to help support them through the discomfort that they might have um, by talking about it, helping support them go to the physical therapist and even like prep for that. And I had an older client who actually was more comfortable going to the physical therapist because it was a medical model uh -huh. versus actually self-examination that was just more traumatic for her right. and scarier for her as well too. Yeah, right. And, and that... Yeah, that's why it can be so helpful to have that integrated model rather than just saying go home, use these dilators, or you know do this exam yourself. And it's it's um, it's good to help you know guide their treatment. Um, so they they'll do the Kegel exercises, and then the the dilators um, basically they are like clinical or medical looking dildos essentially, and um, they have different sizes, so there's a small small size that's, I don't know, maybe a little bit small, maybe around the size of my index finger, and then they go up to a larger size, which is supposed to reflect the average size of a penis um, or a sex toy, and they help the women kind of create a system where they can insert the dilator, do certain um, Kegel exercises and relaxation breathing techniques with the dilator inside, and the idea is to disassociate um, something inside the vagina equals uh, pain. So that's um, that's the big the big point of having uh, vaginal dilators is to for women with pain and um, anorgasmia is to again separate that idea. So something inside the vagina does not equal sex. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the relaxation exercises? Sure. So it'll be, um, in regards to physical therapy, it'll be having the dilators inside, um, contracting the vaginal muscles, and then releasing. So, and then even a, a breath before, like breathing, doing some sort of guided meditation before even using the dilators. Then using the dilators with um, guided meditation or with breathing and sort of relaxing the muscles. And then afterwards, using some sort of guided meditation or uh, progressive body relaxation in order to ease out any tension that they might have experienced. Did that answer mm -hmm. that okay? Yeah, for someone who's really numb, who's not really feeling anything. Uh-huh. Same kind of thing that you... Who isn't feeling anything sexually? Yeah. Like really with anorgasmia? Mm -hmm. um, that, it might work. I don't know in the realm of physical therapy what, what they would do as far as that goes. Um, it's not really something that I've ever come across. So maybe I'll think, think more about it and then chat after or something. Okay. Was there another question? Uh -huh. When you said multidisciplinary approach, because mm -hmm. you you have a lot of different West and Eastern medicine here, do you mm -hmm. just uh, give these out to your clients as if, you know, whichever one fits them? Or do you mm -hmm. say, you know, you need to go to physical therapy plus... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think having a gynecologist, mm -hmm. a physical therapist, and a psychotherapist on board mm -hmm. will be the most helpful. And then from, that would be sort of the groundwork. And then from there, once you work with the client a little bit more and find out what works for them, what doesn't work for them, you might want to integrate something different. So for instance, the Eastern medicine part of it, or um, bringing on a psychiatrist, so it's sort of a foundation of those three, for sure, to get mm -hmm. an assessment. So to get an overall assessment of what the client needs um, on a medical level, on a physical therapy level, and then you can kind of be almost the, the case, sort of the case manager when it comes to those issues. Um, but it's helpful to be able to get a medical rule out and then also to get um, a sense of what, <coughs> excuse me, what the physical therapy approach would be. Sometimes it would only take one one session for a physical therapist to meet with her, do a vaginal exam, and say, okay, all you need is to do the dilation work in this way, and that might be enough for her, for for the um, the client to be able to work on the muscle spasms. And then they wouldn't need to see you after that? Or I would what? say, as because these are typically psych, uh, psychosomatic issues, um, that it's really important to continue on working on um, the psychological 
the social influence that they've come across, um, as long as it's not found that there's strictly a medical issue. If, if they go to a gynecologist and the gynecologist says, oh, she has inflammation of this sort, if she takes this medicine, it'll clear up and it'll be fine, um, and then the client does do that, and she's not feeling any more pain, any more, uh, and she's having orgasms, then there's no need for her to continue. So it's, it's just sort of being, being a guide that um, can, you can have information to be a guide for her treatment to improve, because a lot of medical doctors aren't aware of this do you have referrals for gynecologists that mm -hmm. specialize in this? Because I know a lot don't. Yes, yeah. yes, I do, and they're they're in your um, they're on the slides, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, any other questions around physical therapy? It's also really important to have somebody who's great and aware of these issues, so they can also normalize this issue. Have another medical provider who can normalize it, and then also just encourage healthier physical activity and habits. A lot of times, if we're sitting at a desk. Um, we hold a lot of tension in our bodies in certain ways, and so they can help address that as well. So, as far as the Western medicine, um, Andrea Rapkin, she's at UCLA. She does um, a lot of research in this area of um, vaginal pain, sexual pain, and um, is an excellent resource. She, there, she's also doing a lot of research that women can be a part of, and some of this stuff might um, might fall under the research fund, so it's good for them to be able to check out. She does have a long waiting list, but it's well worth it. She's a rock star in these issues. And then Dr. K Sorry, what is her um, expertise, did you say? Uh, she's a gyno? Gynecologist, uh-huh. These, uh, they both are. Um, Dr. Katie Moyer is actually in our building. She works at the Women's Clinic. Highly knowledgeable about this as well. Very, very wonderful, amazing bedside manner, too. Um, so again, this is a, it's really important to get a medical doctor on, involved because you could work at it from a psychological standpoint all you want, but if there is some sort of medical condition in, um, playing a part in this and it's not being addressed, then the psychological efforts will um, be a lot more challenging and might not even work. So get a, um, a knowledgeable doctor on board. Uh, for the pelvic pain, this is sort of what they do um, that um, Bergeron has found that uh, they get a gynecological history of what might have gone on in the past. They do a Q-tip test to find out where the pain is. They do a physical exam just to make sure that um, the vaginal area is healthy. And then they do um, cultures to make sure that they can rule out infections or diseases. They'll also find out about eating habits, diets, those things. Maybe there's some sort of allergy like a gluten intolerance and that might be um, you might just need to be able to address the gluten intolerance and then um, the vaginal area will sort of repair itself. I mean, they, they can have to get pain, vaginal pain, from a gluten intolerance? Sometimes. Mm-hmm. Do you also find that the pill, I've had a few patients go yes. off the pill and then their pain all of a sudden vanishes. Yes. Yeah, so what, what they're finding is a lot of women's um, vaginas are basically going into menopause, even at a young age. So the vaginal lining is wearing down, so it's thinning out, and then the lubrication has decreased because of the lack of hormones, and then um, the nerves have become a lot more ins more sensitive in a negative way or a painful way rather than a pleasurable way, and so stopping the birth control has, um, like you said, it gets their hormone levels back to normal of where their um, vaginal ways are supposed to be, and it, it's it, sometimes it's as simple as that too. So yeah, really good point. Um, so that's kind of addressing the point of, yeah. Well, especially because that is a problem with older women. As we know, yes. our hormone levels change, obviously. But a lot of, a lot of women are very hormone averse. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering about your, your thoughts and, and experience with dealing with older women who don't want to use hormones but are, mm -hmm. are as a result, mm -hmm. become less sexual. Mm -hmm. So there are, um, and with the Eastern medicine part of it, sort of helps address that, but um, there are other ways to work on the psychological place to help support women and, and get their arousal and desire levels um, back to a level where they were happier with. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there are also a lot more natural um, ways to do it that I'm not very well versed in, um, but homeopathic doctors would have a really great sense, or homeopaths would have a better sense of things that would be more helpful for that. Um, and I, the name of the woman that I'm thinking of is slipping my mind now, but is it Dr. Vaughn? 
Dr. Vaughn? Okay. Holistic uh, hormonal treatments for anti aging for women that are older that are going to. Oh, that's great. Dr. Vaughn? Mm -hmm. In the Great Palisades? Uh, I think it's V O N. Yeah. Who's where? Oh, Pacific Palisades. V O N? Yeah. Okay. She works with yams and, you know, all the naturals. Yeah. Other supplements. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been some talk about uh, stem, stem cell serum mm -hmm. that has been really helpful um, for women who have, are going through menopause and have that experience as well. Um, so that's another option too. Um, so in addressing the tissue damage to work on um, pelvic pain or addressing the sensitivity um, that women might experience, um, that's what's helpful of getting the doctor on board. And then any other gyneco or gynecological or medical conditions, as I mentioned, would be helpful for the doctor to be on board to be able to tell you, okay, we ruled out everything that could possibly or potentially be involved here. Um, so, and then that will give you more information. Surgery, a lot of women come to me and say, well, I heard that there's a surgery and it helps. And it, yes, it does help, but it's almost like a band-aid for these issues because a lot of times women who have experienced this problem and are wanting to result to surgery have been having it for, go on for a really long time, which means that the relationship's been affected, their own arousal and desire levels have been affected. So um, I don't recommend it. I, I only recommend it as sort of a last result, or last effort um, when nothing else has worked. What would okay. they do, change the lining? Um, they can take away a portion of the vestibule, so parts of the skin that are highly sensitive. Uh, the Eastern medicine, uh, I love the, the idea of Tantra and bringing in the sensuality, re-empowering women who have sort of felt like they've lost a little bit of power from having this pain or um, not being able to orgasm. And um, a tantrika that I absolutely adore is Don Cartwright. She's part of our Sex and, Sex and Spirit series here as well. She's teaching, she's leading it tomorrow. Um, so that's her phone number. She does Tantra and she has a, an interest and knowledge in um, women who are experiencing sexual pain, particularly as a result of, um, of menopause too. Um, using acupuncture can be helpful too if women prefer to go the Eastern medicine route. And then um, meditation, which I'll get into a little bit more um, in a minute and yoga can be very, very helpful um, to be able to stretch out all the places that women hold tension. There's a woman by the name of Leslie Howard who does pelvic floor yoga. And she's located in the Bay, um, up in San Francisco, I believe. And every once in a while she comes down to Los Angeles and holds um, pelvic floor yoga workshops. So Leslie Howard. Uh, the other part that I've really been drawn to is this idea of restructuring sex. So a lot of times people take the um, sex and they put it on a pedestal, and then everything else is sort of like the second class citizen, like oral sex, like, or manual sex, or using sex toys in certain ways. Um, and then sometimes even below that is just connection and intimacy and conversation. And so those are t tend to be on the even lower level. But I try to help women understand that if we can put it all on the same level, they have a lot more availability of ways in which they can increase arousal and desire, a lot more ways that they can have fun and get creative with their partners or with themselves. And so teaching them different ways of how to have sex and what sex means and sort of unpacking the idea of what sex is and help them recreate what is important to them about sex. Most of the time, the simple way that I like to see sex is it's two things. It's a physical act, and then it's also intimate connection. And when people want, oftentimes, sometimes it's not those things, but oftentimes what these women are expressing is that they want to be able to have a physical connection with their partner and want to be able to express their intimate feelings for their partner or for themselves. And so that doesn't have to only occur through vaginal penetration. That can occur in different ways. Being able to open up these ideas for them can help them get back, get in touch with their sexual being and who they are as a woman and what it means to be able to express themselves in this way sexually. As I mentioned, the psychiatric um, involvement can help address any 
mood disorders or other issues that might be occurring on a psychiatric level and help women be able to then tap into their internal resources once their mood disorders, for instance, are sort of help supported and taken care of. Um, and then, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm time. Okay. So this will be of the the sort of bigger chunk um, of it. And if we have questions on these, uh, I'll hold them until if you could wouldn't mind holding them till the end. That way we can get through it all. And then I'm happy to answer questions afterwards on the phone, um, whatever you might need. So there has been. Uh, women don't just come and say I can't have I can't have sex comfortably or I um, can't orgasm. It's not just that, and then once that's solved, everything else is okay and better. But there's also some underlying issues of depression, of anxiety that's either caused it or is a result of it, and it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. It's really hard to pinpoint what it is, and so being able to also bring that part into the therapeutic work that you do. Um, Relationship avoidance is another one that, I, as I mentioned, um, a lot of women just find that they've been on date after date after date or have been dating uh, for a while and then once it gets to the physical intimate, physically intimate part, they tend to just check out of the relationship for whatever reason there's a bit of fear associated with it and, um, and so they haven't been in a relationship for a long time. So sometimes they present as I just haven't had a relationship in a while, and I, I would like to, you know, figure out what what's going on. And a lot of reasons, it, or a lot of times, it's because they haven't been able to feel comfortable with engaging in sexual activity. Um, one of the ways that you can work on that in the therapeutic um, work that you do is through developing assertive and um, assertiveness skills, communication skills, relationship building skills, and then also provide psychoeducation of stress reduction, relaxation techniques, and um, talking about anatomy and sexuality as well, and um, pain management when working with pelvic pain issues. So a lot of the um, research that's been done on pelvic pain that's really helpful is cognitive behavioral work. It's not typically where I, um, it's not where I'm trained well in necessarily in, in overall CBT, but when it comes to pelvic pain and anorgasmia, it's extremely helpful. So, um, and this is mainly, like I said, done with assertive communication skills, relationship skills, and communication skills. Um, one of the techniques that's been adapted is through using pain diaries. So keeping a log of when a person, when a female experiences pain, so what was going on before, what time of the day was it, what time of the month was it, um, having her know how, what her feelings were like beforehand, what her feelings were like during the, the period of pain, and what they were after. This provides you a sense of a baseline, and then as your treatment goes on, so you'll want to have them start this in the very, very beginning of the treatment that you do with them, and as uh, your treatment goes on, as the work goes on with the physical therapist or a gynecologist, you'll want them to continue to note it so you can see what works, what doesn't work. Maybe their pain happens at a certain time of the month. Maybe it happens after a long day at work sitting in a chair and that just sort of irritates the nerves. So this way women can start to gain a better sense of control. So they come in and they're sort of chaotic of, I don't know why my pain is happening the way it's happening. And once they start doing the diaries, they realize, oh, it's because I do this and I don't take a break at work. And so you can help them identify something that might relieve the pain, like, okay, so every 30 minutes, get up and stretch. So that way you get some blood flowing, and then also you're not sitting right on the, the vaginal nerves that might cause unprovoked, what seems like unprovoked pain. Do they bring these diaries in to the therapy and read it to you, or? It could be helpful. It, and it might be more helpful for them to just uh, every week take a look at it and sort of summarize what they've found. Um, so the diary isn't, it's not like a free-flowing journal, it's more um, specific bullet points. If you were to type into Google, um, like, let's see, thought, like cognitive behavioral thought diary, it'll give a good structure of what you could use, um, and then sort of adapt it to pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. I think what's important also in that is realizing that for a certain percentage, 
for women to develop the pain as a way of, a, of avoiding the intimacy. Yes. So you've got to get into that as well. So what is happening in your primary relationship prior to uh, becoming sexual mm -hmm. and then after becoming sexual? So yep. you can look for those kinds of patterns as well. Yep, absolutely. I call that the like avoidance cycle, right. and I help women sort of identify what their avoidance cycle is. and. Uh, that way they can figure out exactly like what you're saying of, of what's going on in the relationship that causes the pain too. That's an excellent point. Um, so learning effective communication skills too and, and assertiveness skills. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the avoidance cycle up there. Um, so doing the, the communication skills and the relationship skills of being able to uh, sort of have difficult conversations with their partners about their pain, about a conflict or an issue that they have, and these ways help them, talking in these ways with their partners or with other people in general too, helps them develop a sense of assertiveness. And for the most part, a lot of the women who come in with these issues feel a sense of disempowerment. They feel sort of out of control with their own bodies. And so being able to address that from a different vantage point of just asserting, asserting themselves with other people in the world helps re-empower them. That makes sense. Felt like that, I said 10 times more work than I needed to for that. Um, okay, so cognitive restructuring is another way that um, CBT work comes into play. And this is mainly for pelvic pain. Um, and you'll want to get a sense of when the pain happens, again with the diaries, and you can notice where the cognitive distortions occur, at what point, whether they occur with anticipation of pain, um, during the pain, or after the pain. And then the typical cognitive distortions that happen are hypervigilance and catastrophizing. Um, so these two in particular are very, very common. The hypervigilance is basically, for instance, a partner reaches for um, your client's hand and she pulls away or she kind of clenches up or just sort of lets go of the hand and it causes some conflict. That simple reaching of the hand could message to her, oh, he's touching my hand, that means he wants to be physical with me, which means he wants to have sex, which means I'm going to have pain. And so she's, on, she's hyper alert and hyper aware of trying to figure out what it is that's going to lead to pain, but then what happens is, like what, uh, Judy, right? Mm -hmm is the avoidance sort of happens and the pain happens as a result of what she's been sort of triggered or primed to experience. Um, and then catastrophizing is looking at one episode and thinking that's going to happen for every time that any sort of sexual involvement happens. That, oh, th this pain is happening now, which means it's going to happen every time or it's going to happen for the rest of my life, which is a really, really heavy thing for a woman to have to sit with especially if she's been dealing with it for years. Um, pain management, if you, the research that's been conducted on any sort of chronic pain issues can be extremely helpful in working with women who have pelvic pain um, and just take any of the techniques or treatments and sort of try to adapt it to pelvic pain can be helpful as well if you're finding that you want more resources. Those, that's something that you can look into. Um, and then the, the gate control theory of pain is something I like to describe to clients. So there's this mechanism in our brain that if we feel, uh, if we get a cut on our leg, it's going to go up to our brain and say, ow, that hurt, and what do I need to do in order to take care of the cut on my pain, or on my leg? Um, the mechanism that's in our brain, we can control how much we experience the pain based on several different things. and what happens is the gate can either open up and we experience more pain, or we can close, we can do things to close the gate and then we'll experience less pain. The best way I can describe this um, in a sort of tangible way is we take painkillers, and painkillers are things that close the gate so that we experience less pain. So the, the damage is still on our leg, but we're experiencing it less in our heads. And so this is why a psychological approach to working with the pain is really helpful because you can teach the women coping skills in order to keep the gate a little bit more closed rather than completely open like it's pro it probably is for these women. So some of those things that close the gate are um, mental 
mental factors, so addressing anxiety and depression around these feelings, um, addressing anxiety in general, addressing the stress that are, that's in their lives. So reducing stress can help close the gate. Um, doing physical therapy like stretching or exercising, getting plenty of water, those are the things that can help close the gate. Sort of keeping the body operating at an optimal level helps these women um, help their vaginas be a lot more, uh, operating also at a lot more optimal of a level. Um, and then also another one is having women do appropriate amounts of um, exercise, for instance, but vaginal exercise. So for instance, if a woman is using, is having a lot of penetration and she's having sex or using a sex toy for 30 minutes, yeah, that might cause some pain. And so maybe just starting to realize what the threshold is for this woman. It might be six minutes, it might be 15, it might be one minute and just helping her get a sense of what is too long and having her be sort of in her head in a sense and to be a lot more aware of her body and knowing, okay, this is my limitation and then helping her develop that assert assertiveness to say to her partner or um, realization to stop using the penetration um, and so to say to her partner, okay, I think I've had enough, let's try something different um, and then and taking care of herself in that way. Okay, so um, the stress reduction and relaxation techniques. The oh, oh, sure, no problem. Thanks for coming. Oh, great. Thanks for coming. If you have questions, feel free to call or email. I would love to talk to you about it more with CBT's tattoos. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh -huh. um, so the relaxation response essentially is the opposite of the flight or fight response. The flight or fight response, as I'm sure you know, is um, what keeps us protected and safe and alive. Um, so it's something that's developed in our animal brain and um, keeps us alive, like I said. It's triggered by the amygdala and we either choose to run away or we choose to um, fight. And then also sometimes just freeze. What happens is in the flight or fight or flee response, our body shuts down to only allow for whatever is going we need in order to survive that moment, which is not our, our sexual reproductive um, organs or system. So arousal and desire is completely shut down. And if a reaching of the hand from her partner triggers that flight or fight system, her body is not going to be able to get into a place where she can have a comfortable um, sexual experience or an orgasm or any desire whatsoever. So you're wanting to even through the pain diaries, through figuring out what the avoidance cycle is, you want to start to realize at what point can you make an intervention or throw a wrench in that cycle in order to calm down that system. And one way to do that is by inducing the relaxation response. While the flight or fight response is automatic, it's not automatic for us to have the relaxation response. And this is not done through just simply watching a movie or reading a book. It's something that takes practice and it takes a lot of um, mindful focus. So this is where meditation and mindful awareness comes in. Being able to get focused on one repetitive thought or one repetitive motion or breathing um, while sitting still uh, is extremely helpful in starting to develop that resource that women can tap into in the moments when they want to be sexual. Having them practice daily, even if it's five minutes a day, that will do wonders for the woman. Um, it'll do wonders for her system to start to calm down and be able to regulate itself in those moments. So that over time, once you've done a lot of work on this, they can, the women can get to a place where they start to notice where their avoidance cycle and their flight or fight is going to kick in and they can say, okay, this is, this is not a scary situation, it's okay, I'm going to tap into the resource of relaxation, and they can maybe take a breath, or you know, 10, 10 breaths for that moment to be able to help calm their system down. They're not used to having a calm system, they're used to a regular, an upregulated system, or dysregulated system. Um, there's an amazing program through UCLA, it's called MARC, M-A-R-C, um, it's the Mindful Awareness Research Center, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, they do mindful awareness practice classes. 
usually held in the evenings all throughout Los Angeles, I believe, and um, very affordable. It's something that I highly recommend that you do as clinicians to be able to learn just a sense of the theory and practice of mindful awareness and, medit and guided meditation, because you can use that in your own personal life as well as clinically. Um, and you just meet a lot of really great people involved too. All right. Um, Helping them have an understanding of the mindful awareness and meditation can help them also understand the cognitive processes that they go through when it comes to these cognitive distortions that come into play, like the hypervigilance. So um, in mindful awareness and in meditation, the emphasis is on um, trying to have a clear, clear mind, but if there is not a clear mind, it's okay. And to be able to notice the thoughts that come in that are distracting or notice the sounds that are distracting and be able to not judge them and just sort of let them go and return to the breath or return to the body. And um, the key part is having no judgment. So teaching women compassion for themselves by um, instructing this through meditation can also help them have internalized <coughs> compassion for themselves in general. Um, so teaching them, okay, if a thought comes in, just notice it, there it is, and now return to your breath. You can transfer that also over to the cognitive um, processes when you're trying to do the cognitive restructuring of when, they, when you start to notice and identify what the automatic thoughts are that come in, that you'll want to just have them notice, okay, that's an automatic thought that hasn't been so helpful in the past, so I'm going to let that one go, and I'm not going to judge myself for it, and I'm going to try to use a different coping statement. So for instance, this pain isn't going to happen, and it's okay that it's there, and I will breathe through it, and I will tell my partner that I'm, I'm done having sex in this way. Mm -hmm. So teaching them sort of to just let the thoughts come, if the thoughts come in, that they're okay to, to be there, and then you know, ask them very kindly, will you please leave? And replace them with, with happier, more positive, more coping um, type of responses. Um, the big part that's really important for me, as I mentioned earlier, is the sense of empowerment. Um, and in the sex therapy that you do, getting a sense of what their beliefs and values are around sex and sexuality and how they've been influenced by the culture and by society. Um, the exploration around the values and beliefs and the body, their body images, their sense of, um, their sense of self, their sense of worth, their ideas of self-esteem, will be very key in trying to figure out who this woman is and how sex, how this sort of lack of, of sex or lack of orgasm has impacted her. Mm -hmm. A lot of women f um, come in who, uh, for instance, are married to a, to a male partner might say, I don't feel like a worthy wife. I don't feel like I can do my duty as a wife because I cannot provide a sexual relationship for my husband. And uh, I've had women say, I just don't eat, like, how, when I embody and think of myself as a woman, this idea of being able to be a sexual woman has been completely taken away from me. How am I supposed to think of myself as a woman? How am I supposed to I identify with the idea of a woman? Because I can't even enjoy my sexuality this way. And to be able to say that, to, to have the clients say that to you, and to be able to be heard and explore what that weight has been like for them, can really increase their sense of empowerment. Um, because a lot of women say that they feel like they've been robbed of a life that they think that they should have. So there's a sense of grief around it. So exploring the grief uh, and the loss of a sexuality that they wish they could have, um, that they haven't had for a long time. Doesn't mean that you can't have it again in the future, um, but they have certainly expressed feeling like they've lost something for years out of their life. Um, they might have even lost partners as a result. Um, some, some women have come to me saying that this was a deal breaker for a lot of their partners and just completely crushing. Um, I think I like to also link it to erectile dysfunction in men or erectile difficulties. Excuse me, that's more sex positive way I like to look at it is erectile difficulties. Um, linking that for men, if you have a male partner in the room, be able to say, could you imagine not being able to have an erection that was satisfying enough for your partner for the last 10 years? Men tend to get it a lot more that way. Um, 
if they need you know other examples. Um, encouraging uh, masturbation and self exploration will be also another key starting point. I had a client who said that she had just become completely disconnected from her vagina and through the work that we did in our group she became friends with her vagina. So doing the a mirror exam, um, just taking a mirror, finding a time when it's really comfortable for the woman, maybe light some candles, take a bath, and then explore and check out all the folds and all the different textures and the different sorts of lubrication at different times. Um, and really being able to empower the women to get very comfortable with their vaginas will help them um, get empowered about their sexuality as well. Um, you also might need to, to teach them a little bit about anatomy. So picking up a book like um, A Guide to Getting It On is a really, really great uh, sex education book that we don't typically get in life and I think everybody sh it's, should be like a requirement at a certain point, <laughs> maybe in college. Um, Lonnie Barbach has an amazing uh, book on helping women orgasm. And she talks about the psychological aphrodisiacs. What's her name? Lonnie Barbach. How do you spell? It's on the last slide too, but um, it's L-O-N-N-I-E, D-A-R-B-A-C-H. Uh, she, she has For Yourself, which is for the women only. Uh, well, it address, addresses women, but can be read by anybody, obviously. And then For Each Other, for couples. Um, the three most common are erotica. So graphic and written as well as video. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey just took women by storm and women were finally talking about sex and sexuality, getting really highly turned on. Uh, another one that's a little bit like less currently mainstream but was uh, a bit ago was My Secret Garden. So it's a compilation of stories of, um, of different scenarios and can be highly erotic and it'd be a great way to tap into um, increasing the arousal and desire for women. Mm -hmm. uh, nine and a half weeks and closer, just some ideas that you know they can watch as erotica for women that gives them places to choose or to find examples of what might turn them on. Someone might just say, I just don't know what turns me on anymore. And so giving them places to pull from, books and movies and stories of other women. LetMeDoThis.com has been um, it's a website that seems to be a lot more, it's less pornographic and more erotic. It's beautiful um, photography and it includes men and women. It is, one of the drawbacks is that it's um, mainly from like a heterosexual male's perspective, but um, it does include uh, lesbian women, but um, so it's, that's sort of, it's not completely spanning the entire board, but it's a great place to start. Let me do this. Let me do this dot com. And what is that, what is it? Can so it's, it's a Tumblr account of pictures, pornographic pictures and videos, or erotic pictures and videos um, that are done very tastefully and, you know, soft lighting. Um, it's just, it's a very beautiful site of, of sexually explicit um, pictures that aren't degrading of women, sort of female centric. Um, so a lot of women like to uh, feel a little bit more comfortable looking at pornographic or erotic pictures this way. Um, another one is getting women to focus on their pleasurable sensations. This is where um, being able to ha be mindfully aware of their bodies will be very helpful. So helping women guide their focus and their breath into their vaginal area or into other parts of their body that they're feeling sensations when having a sexual experience or when um, self-pleasuring. And then fantasy. This is a place where women can feel safe and in charge. And it's really important to help normalize what their fantasies are because a lot of women feel guilt about um, any of their fantasies that they might be having, but in particular like rape fantasies are very common for women that they feel really guilty and, and shameful about. But being able to normalize that any fantasy is okay because it's not a behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to process with them what they feel uh, guilty or ashamed about with their fantasies, but it's a really helpful way for them to feel and stay in charge of their sexual arousal. Um, and then it's going to change from client to client what they find interesting, so you'll want to do trial and error and experimentation, figure out what worked, what didn't work, and why. Um, so as Douglas mentioned, uh, I have found a lot of success in group psychotherapy 
for these issues and it's mainly because it's the idea of you two, like you've had this experience too, I thought I was the only one in the world. Um, and seeing these women start to connect and realize that they're not alone in their struggle is just profoundly impactful. Um, it also provides a place where they can get ideas from each other. So starting to, um, when it's just you and the client in the room, the ideas are going to come from the client or yourself. And that's pretty limiting. So if you can have other women involved who have had their own life experiences bring in things that they've tried. Um, for instance, I heard about coconut oil from one of the women in my group as a lubricant, as a self-lubricant or a partner lubricant. And that's changed so many women's lives. And as I've passed that on, using uh, this natural lubrication has been amazing. The only thing is with coconut oil, it's not compatible with condoms or a latex barrier, so just keep that in mind. And also might break down some um, sex toys, so just be aware of that too. All right, last week someone said use coconut oil as for a mouthwash, and it worked oh, on, really? on gum issues. Just Interesting. Just cure your gum issues. Works as a lotion too. Right, <laughs> hair conditioner, <laughs> like cuticle oil. It's That's fantastic. <laughs> All of one helps. Yeah. Uh, also there we go. <laughs> it's amazing. All over the place. Um, yeah. Oh, and then the other really helpful part about the group therapy is that women can help use feedback with each other on doing the cognitive restructuring. So if you're teaching them the cognitive restructuring and as a woman is sharing an experience, they can call each other out and say, oh hey, that was that time like that you used hypervigilance. And she won't even realize she's doing it and it helps support you and gets them starting to realize what cognitive distortions are and how they might be able to change it themselves. Because if they can practice it themselves with each other, it'll be a lot more, um, it, it'll stand out a lot more to them, be a lot more salient. And um, when you're working with women with pelvic pain or anorgasmia, be prepared to work really hard. Um, this is a, these are really, really difficult issues to tackle. And um, a lot of women are going to come, come in sort of discouraged and like, there's, what are you going to do? You're gonna talk me through my vaginal pain? No way. And, um, and so there is a lot of pushback that I've, I've received and um, just normalizing that, understanding where they're coming from. And it might take several months before you actually get any traction anywhere. I had to um, bring in with one of my clients, we'd been working together for three months we weren't getting anywhere. It was very frustrating for her, very frustrating for me. And finally, I just brought into the room that it felt like I was kind of coming up against a wall with her every time that I tried to um, talk about what might be going on. And as soon as we sort of talked about that difficult part of the process, things started to let go. And she literally let go with her body. And then within maybe a month or two, her vaginismus was resolved, and she was happy and excited. So. Um, Knowing that it's a diff and that was early on in my in working with these women, so knowing that now has been extremely helpful in being prepared to work really hard and for a long period of time before seeing any sort of um, resolve or any sort of movement. I always encourage my clients that we want to find progress, not perfection. The smallest little um, win is should be celebrated like it's the biggest win possible. So if a woman's able to get a tampon in for one day out of her menstrual cycle and she's never been able to do it, that's like, it's like she's won the lottery and, and, and live that with her too. Uh, a lot of times women, as a result of the hard work and how long it's taken, it, they will drop out. And so just be aware that it's, it's something that, that will just unfortunately happen. Um, but, but you know, hopefully at some point they'll remember the work that you did and either return or seek out help and support um, another time later on. And again, always bringing in the partner if possible. Um, so some shameless self-promotion. My um, <laughs> group <laughs> occurs on Saturday mornings. Uh, it will be starting up in September. And I, like Douglas was saying, what CHS does, I like to work in conjunction or as adjunctive treatment to the work that you're doing. Um, so if you have couples or um, individual clients, having them in this group is really helpful and I think could be really supportive of the work that you do. Would you just, is it for female sexuality in general or is it just specific to these issues that we it's, talked about? With it's specific pain? to the issues of pain. Okay. Um, 
it's not even really, if a woman isn't experiencing pain but is experiencing or isn't experiencing orgasms, it's not really for her either. It's mainly the focus is pelvic pain. And what do you um, charge? Sexual pain. Uh, the group, each session is 55 per session um, if pain with cash or check, and then 60 if pain with a credit card. Um, and it, yeah, thank you, it's in the brochure. Uh, they and they've been going on for two years now, um, so I plan on having them continuously. So if you don't have a client that can make it in September, they'll always be um, they going on. Time. No, it's it's starting. It's a closed group, so it starts. It's ten sessions, mm -hmm. um, and then there is one session that will integrate their partner. If they have a partner, they can bring their partner in for one of the sessions, mm -hmm. and we have all the partners come together. That way, the partner can be on board and understand what's. Um, been going on for them and then um, do you have an exact start date in September? Or? It'll probably be the second or third week uh, weekend because the first weekend's Labor Day week, sort of around Labor Day weekend um, and then in, let's see I'm happy to work with uh, payment plans if they need it too because I like to take the payment all at the beginning um, but sometimes it's hard for the 10 sessions all at the beginning. Um, if they are not able to make a session, I'm happy to do a phone um, check-in with them. It's usually like 20 or 30 minutes I go over what we discussed in the session and then talk about whatever is going on for them so that they don't feel like they're behind or missing out on anything. Uh, and when they return to the next session that they can feel like they're connected with everybody. And then what's, what's been nice is that from the first, from um, the women going through these groups, They've been able to, we did like a graduation group. So the women who have gone through this treatment program now come to their own group and it's just sort of a process group that meets once a month. So um, that's also nice. Please feel free to contact me whenever you need. And if you have questions, um, I'm here. So please come ask me. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.